everyone. We'll make a start. I'm Mike Higton. I'm um, part of the academic leadership for Common Awards from the Durham University side, and it's uh, my delight to welcome you and to welcome our speakers today. I'm going to get out of the way in just a moment, but I want to say thank you to David Clough, Sarah Lawrence, Cheryl Hunt and Joel Pierce for being with us today and for leading this webinar. We've been the Commonwealth team, we've been collaborating with um, a project on Christian ethics of farmed animal welfare. And this is a webinar that comes out of that collaboration um, and uh, exploring the question what that project has to do with Christian ministry. But I'm going to hand over to Sarah at this point. Um, but it's a delight to see you all here today. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. It's really lovely to see you or see a few of you. Um, we're going to structure this webinar in a slightly different way to normal, so I'll kind of start off with a bit of a kind of uh, uh, what to expect. But we're going to, each each of the four of us are going to be exploring in different ways from different perspectives uh, the question, what have animals got to do with um, Christian ministry? Now you might think that the obvious, the uh, the answer is completely obvious because owning a dog is an entirely necessary um, uh, feature of Christian ministry. We all know what a brilliant way it is to get to know your community. Um, or you might be thinking about pet services, which are also fantastic. Um, but we're going to be thinking a little bit more broadly about uh, maybe a broader range of animals and thinking about what's the theology behind our relationship with animals. So, different perspectives. We're going to start off with um, Cheryl Hunt. Do you want to wave Cheryl? Cheryl? Lovely. Uh, Cheryl's the academic registrar and tutor at SWMTC in Exeter. Um, and she's going to give us some biblical perspectives on the question. Then we're going to hear from Joel. Say hello, Joel. <laughs> There we go. Uh, Joel Pierce is the Associate Tutor at the Scottish Episcopal Institute uh, and Administrator of Christ's College at the University of Aberdeen. So welcome to Joel. He's going to be exploring some ethical and some theological perspectives. Uh, then you're going to hear from me. I'm Sarah Lawrence. I'm the Director of Studies at Lincoln School of Theology. And I'm going to have a little look at the five marks of mission um, from an animal perspective. And then finally, and uh, uh, coming to a climax, we're going to hear from uh, David Clough, who is the uh, Chair in Theology and Applied Sciences at the University of Aberdeen. And he's going to talk about that project, um, uh, the Christian Ethics of Farmed Animal Welfare. So that's the structure. We're going to have a bit of time each speaking and then a bit of discussion between each of us. So it's, uh, it's going to be peppered with discussion as we go. Is that OK? So I'm going to hand over to Cheryl for our first slot. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you, Sarah. So in good reflective practice, um, practice, we're going to start with the biblical text, which might be relevant to answering the question, what have animals got to do with Christian ministry? And I've sort of based this set of biblical texts around the question to start with, to answer the question, why should Christians be concerned with this topic? I don't need to tell you that we follow, we believe in a creator who not only made all things, but sustains the creation. Uh, and so since all the things around us, including the animals are God's handiwork, that might be said to be in itself a good enough reason to be concerned with animals and animal theology. Of course, the second point I've made here is the contextual one. We are at an unprecedented point in history where the numbers and the level of technology exercised by um, the human beings on the planet is having a profound effect, not only on the chemical um, and plastic uh, constituents of the planet itself, but on the climate and these effects are being felt by all living creatures to a greater or lesser extent. So this is another good reason for us thinking about this topic. And coming out of the project, as Sarah explained about farmed animal welfare, it's not often recognized when we're busy ooing and ahhing at David Attenborough's programs on the TV, that actually our domestic animals far outweigh in biomass 
um, the mass of, of wild animals on the planet. Um, and so, in fact, the question of how we interact with animals in general has a proportionally greater bearing, if you like, on the animals over whose conditions we have substantially more control. So the domestic animals are not just a, an add-on here, but they are actually a substantive part of the question. So we're going to look very briefly at some biblical texts. There'll be loads I'm sure you can think of that I haven't included, though there simply isn't room for more. As I said just now, creation is God's. In the Christian worldview, um, the texts make it clear that creation is not a mistake or an accident. It's a deliberate action of God's. And God pronounces seven times, God pronounces that the different stages in creation are good. The different aspects are proper. It's not a word that implies perfect, but more in accordance with the proper place, the proper function. Things are in their, in their right order. It's a, it's a system of order. God has made it good. And then at the end, with humanity, is, when humanity is present, then it is very good. But all of it is good. The sea monsters and other sea creatures, the birds in the air and all the creatures on the earth, the land animals, both the wild and domesticated animals and what I suppose nowadays we might call the creepy crawlies, the, the creatures that, that crawl on the earth. They're all good. And we don't worship a God who we think of as setting things in motion and, and letting it all run like a well-oiled machine. We worship a God whom the biblical texts attest again and again is involved in creation and maintains and keeps it. So we find amongst the, the language of psalmist use a clear recognition that it is God who is responsible for the rain coming and watering the earth. It is God who makes the grass grow for the animals and the plants for humans. It is God who feeds the animals. Um, and for that reason, then, we find the kind of appeal that is epitomized in Psalm 148, where all of creation is called upon to praise God, because all of creation, all the creatures, owe their continued existence to God. And that, again, includes the sea monsters, the wild and domesticated, the birds and the creepy crawlies. If everything is included in this call, everything depends on God. But it's not just that it depends on God, but that God has a relationship with the whole of creation. And this is particularly evident following the flood. God comes and promises that God won't flood the earth again. He won't destroy all the land creatures again. But the promise and the covenant not to do so is made not just with Noah or with the other humans with Noah, but with every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth every living creature. God has a covenant with them. The rainbow is not just for us. And we find that this inclusion even extends to the passages in the Bible which speak of the new age of when God will make all things well at the end of time. The eschaton is, when it's described, is not something that it is exclusively involving human beings. All living creatures seem to be involved in the redemptive project. And there's just a few listed here, but you can see there's a sweep through from, from the prophets right through into the end, through and into the end of the New Testament. So, for instance, the Romans 8 passage, um, which is often used in Christian eco-theological reflection, uh, is key here. Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit and then he suddenly uh, starts talking about creation and modern scholars agree now that the reference here must be to non-human creation. It doesn't make sense of, of Paul's logic um, if you try to just make it mean only humans. So it's the non-human creation and this creation is waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Yeah, that's generally interpreted as meaning a reference to the resurrection and the, the new heaven and new earth, the new life that Christians are called into. So why is creation waiting with eager longing for this? What the rest of creation got to do with it? Well, the passage goes on, creation itself at that point will be set free 
from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, whether that decay is a reference to the general processes of life and death and every living thing dying, or whether it's a, a broader, we could maybe read it as a broader reference to extinction with what we know of, of the history of life on earth. But either way, it's something, decay is not good. And the freedom of the glory of the children of God, however that is intended, is certainly something positive. So creation has a hope because creation anticipates being involved in God's redemptive project. And of course, there's other passages we could look at with reference to that. Now, one of the other key passages that often is looked at in, in these contexts it are the creation passages and particularly the creation of humanity and this point where human beings are, are said to be made in the image of God. And this is linked with having dominion and some also link it to the subdue and the earth and have dominion. So the language here uh, is, is open to interpretation and there have been a number of different ways of reading this language because it can sound quite uh, hierarchical and, and quite violent. Uh, but there are there are sort of different ways of reading that text now. But whatever we do with it, there's clearly some kind of relationship between humanity and the rest of creation and implying at least to some extent some responsibility. And consonant with that idea, as we read through the Hebrew texts, amongst all the instructions for the Israelites about different aspects of their lives and the way God makes it clear that God is involved in everything they do, eating, sleeping, having sex, worshipping, everything is all of, all of a one piece, as it were. Um, in consonant with that, there are some passages talking about how to treat your domestic animals. They are included in Be Fruitful and Multiply. They are not excluded here. That, that is for them. They are included in the Sabbath rest. And knowing how to treat your animals well is a sign of a righteous person. This is a quality to be cultivated. There's a sense of justice. Whatever Paul does with this passage in 1 Corinthians 9, applying it to, to human beings, it's obvious in the original context that it is talking about if you've, you're using an animal, you need, you need to feed it. It's not fair if you're starving the animal when there's food in front of it. And from Jesus' comments about the Sabbath in the Gospels, it's clear that care of animals is expected even on the Sabbath day. The animals get a rest, but also they do have to get cared for. Even if the humans are supposed to be resting, that rest nevertheless allows for the care of their animals. Now, you might say, well, yes, but the Israelites had all these instructions for killing animals, for all these sacrifices, bloodbath they seem to have had. Well, that's true. Um, and that's an integral part of their cultic uh, processes. But even then, there were conditions imposed. The firstborn male of each animal was to be sacrificed to Yahweh, but it was not to be taken away from its mother until after a week had passed, so that there was some time there together. And even when it was sacrificed, you weren't to sacrifice the parent in time as the firstborn. And livestock the other domestic animals are included in these visions of the end time i said the animals are included but specifically livestock and wild animals are both included so here we see the uh, the images in isaiah of um sowing beside every stream that's of abundance and flourishing the ox and the donkey range freely um and elsewhere in isaiah uh, the oxen and donkeys eating silage there's an uh, there's a plenitude there's a um a flourishing here, which is part of God's shalom vision for the age to come. And the classic passages, of course, where the predators lie down neck to the prey and prey don't have to fear um, the lion eating straw kind of imagery. There is a peace as a shalom reigning, not just between humans and animals, but between domesticated and wild, between predator and prey. All of the creation is included in this vision of Shalom. And so given this theme all the way through the text, should Christians be concerned with animals? Well, 
I feel the answer is yes, but this is a point where you can chip in. Uh, and if we agree that animals should be should feature in, in our actions and ministry and discipleship processes, then what ideas might we have for making that evident in our ministry? And when I say ministry, I'm referring as a good non-Anglican, I'm referring to lay a laity and ordained. So it's not a specific group. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. And we're going to have to move on, I'm afraid. Um, over to Joel for our next section. OK, so, uh, yeah, I'm an ethicist, I guess. <laughs> I am up at Aberdeen and I uh, hadn't really done much with animals before getting involved with this project. Um, I usually do stuff on human rights. Um, so this was uh, a really uh, fascinating foray into a new field for me, but I'm still learning. And so you get to see kind of what I've learned as I've gone along. <laughs> um, I um, live at kind of the intersection of philosophy and theology. And so when I think about animal ethics or animal welfare, usually what I think about is philosophical people. And that's actually where I encountered almost all discussion of animal welfare prior to getting involved in this project. And if you have been involved with animal welfare, you probably recognize this guy um, on my slide, Peter Singer, who's like, if you read about animal welfare and philosophy departments, that's who you talk, talk about. Um, and, you know, and I knew, okay, there's like charities that do this kind of stuff as well. Um, and maybe you see stuff on social media where people are concerned about this. But in terms of my theology background, we didn't talk about this all the way through the end of me completing my PhD. And the only time I ever really talked about it um, was I went to a seminar that David's, where David's book was read like a, a year or two ago. Um, so I was like, is this a Christian thing or is it something where the world is speaking into the church and we need to listen? Um, but as I've got involved in this project, uh, I've discovered that actually it is a Christian thing, <laughs> um, not just in terms of biblical text, but in terms of Christian history. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a picture of one strand of Christian history, um, the British Christian history, um, and ethical reflection that's happened in that um, today. I'm sure there's different ways of talking about this in different Christian contexts as well, but something that touches on our uh, shared British Christian history, a lot of Anglican stuff in here as well, even though I'm up in Scotland with, with all the Presbyterians, um, but most of the people involved here are Anglicans. Um, so animal welfare in terms of how I heard the story in philosophy class was something that started with Jeremy Bentham, um, that he was the great utilitarian philosopher. And because he just focused on pleasure and pain, he recognized that animals had pleasures and pains. And so he thought that they were ethically interesting and important. Um, what I discovered as I looked into the history of this uh, in terms of Christian ethical reflection is that actually prior to Bentham writing, and four years prior to kind of Bentham's big work, there was uh, this uh, quite lengthy pamphlet published by a man named Humphrey Primitt, um, Church of England uh, priest. And it actually presented a lot of the ideas that Bentham had before Bentham presented them. <laughs> <laughs> um, focusing on pleasure and pain, but also animal rights. And it came out of, uh, Primit was an abolitionist, um, and he kind of took the ideas of the abolitionist movement and said, well, if we're not going to be cruel to other humans, cruel and inhumane treatment of other humans is wrong, surely that's true of animals as well. Um, and this actually, this pamphlet got a lot of uh, circulation in the early animal welfare movement um, and he most and he engages with a lot of the biblical texts actually in that that um, Cheryl was talking about. Um, and so um, from kind of him, like he was more influential probably than Bentham it, right at the get get go. Um, people start debating having legislation um, in terms of stopping this kind of thing. And the legislation that uh, the way it gets debated, um, is often in terms of Christian principles. So we get things about Christian or human dominion, and yes, you know, it is human dominion. But then it says, people like Lord Erskine, who was the Lord Chancellor at that time, said, but actually, if it's human dominion, it needs to be one that's a, of a moral trust. Um, we need to have to make space for animal rights within this dominion. Um, and that bill didn't pass. But uh, following on from that, um, in about a little over a decade later, uh, there was a kind of a twin movement, one to push legislation through parliament and one to set up a society to protect annual, animal rights. And there were kind of 
people from both who were working on both sides of that were in communication with each other and oftentimes just were the same people. Um, and so the first animal welfare bill that passed um, in the UK was in 1822. And the SPCA, which became the RSPCA about 20 years later, um, was set up around that time too. And the person who set it up was again, a Church of England priest, uh, Arthur Broom, um, again, coming from that abolitionist movement and you'll see if you, I've made a list of uh, like the patrons and patronesses, but if you look below there, there's the office holders and you might see a few familiar names there. William Wilberforce is there as well. Um, so yeah, again, from out of this abolitionist movement into a kind of um, animal welfare movement as well. And this continues right through the 19th century and people develop the arguments and maybe the arguments go in strange and interesting places. So um, you, arguments start with like people like Primit about minimizing pain, and then you get Erskine about responsible dominion. Um, in the 19th century, I think there was maybe following on from Kant's kind of uh, turn to the subject, there's a worry that uh, being cruel to animals, the real reason it's problematic is that it's corrupting of people, right? And often corrupting of men is the way that it's phrased in these sorts of things. Um, and so there's this worry that if we allow men to be cruel to animals, they can't be good Christians. And so that's why we need to um, get the animal welfare legislation through. And then as you go into the late 19th century, um, and Britain is self-consciously an imperial power, and they're trying to justify why they're an imperial power, you get these kind of move to say, oh, it's not civilized to do this sorts of thing. So this it, the debate kind of gets sucked up into that whole thing. So sometimes things go in maybe problematic places. But um, in any case, the debate continues um, all the way through the 19th century and into the 20th. Um, but so why didn't I like have any of this when I was <laughs> doing theology? And I think maybe part of it is that we just had a massive social change from the 19th into the 20th century and now into the 21st. And that now almost all people, no, well, most people live either in, uh, in cities or in, you know, bedroom communities of cities. Not many people are farming these days in the UK. And so some of that concern that was in the 19th century where it existed where, um, you know, people could be cruel to livestock on a daily basis because a lot of people were interacting with livestock and a lot of us don't, right? Um, and we just, and in addition to that, what's happened is farming has gone industrial, right? Um, so that there's less people working on it and uh, animals are packed into smaller spaces and they're seen more as kind of cogs and machines that, you know, factory or, uh, egg producing machines rather than sentient creatures. Um, and we don't have to think about it because they're far away. Um, additionally, yeah, so that's kind of our context, I think, but we do have some tools maybe that have been developed and that are shaping the conversation today. So uh, there's new kinds of philosophical approaches. So I think one I'd highlight is that there's a, been a turn to maybe things like virtue ethics, where you can talk about things in terms of flourishing rather than just like minimalistic kind of things in pleasure and pain, you can talk kind of more holistically about uh, what it is to have a good life. Um, there's also been a kind of suspicion of that turn to the subject in the 19th century where it's maybe there's actually valuable things that are valuable in themselves beyond what they um, how they impact on humans and animals have a sort of value uh, philosophically in terms of themselves, but also as a Christian, they have a value to God um, apart from how they relate to humans. And so there's different uh, ways of talking about what's going on in these sorts of moves in, theologically. So um, Cheryl's already highlighted that uh, there's ways of thinking about animals in terms of their participation in reconciliation, redemption, in the eschaton. I think uh, other things that are kind of interesting that if you want to look into, these are live and active areas of debate is uh, what does it mean for uh, the Imago Dei? Like, is that something that is exclusively human still? Um, do we want to talk about animals participating in the Imago Dei, perhaps? Um, that's a very live area of debate. And then also thinking that of humans um, as embodied creatures, um, having a body is something we share with animals. And thinking about what does it mean that we're animals, um, that we're part of an extended uh, creation of animals that are in interaction and in community with each other. So these are all kinds of things that people are reflecting on today. Um, so that's kind of, that feels very like 
very theologically abstract. <laughs> so what does it have to do with ministry? Well, um, I suspect one thing it might have to say uh, is that history of Christians engaging with animal welfare might help us to tell a slightly different story. This isn't something that's coming from outside the church in. This is something that's been in the church um, that we need to attend to the uh, voices of our forebears um, in faith. Um, and I think also it can help us to think about what it means to expand our vision of God's creative uh, or caring and redemptive activities, and also to to think about ways in which the church can be countercultural. And I think um, in terms of the fair trade movement, the church was pretty early to get into that, and that was that helped form our identity, at least here in the UK, in terms of how we participate in the market and such things. And I think um, thinking about what what it means to care about animal welfare can be a place where the church could do something along the lines of the fair trade movement and think about, okay, what does it mean for us to uh, interact with creation through high animal welfare kind of standards and things like that nature. So those are, hopefully that's just given you some things to think about. Um, I can answer questions, though I might push them back to you because it seems like we've got a very well-informed audience today. <laughs> so you might know a lot more about this than me. Um, but I'd love to hear any thoughts on this kind of thing. Uh, Thank you. That's really fascinating. I think perhaps time is marching on. So if it's all right, we'll go on to the next session, uh, which is me. So I'm going to be uh, addressing the question of um, the relationship between the five marks of mission and um, what animals have to do with Christian ministry. So I'm sure you're familiar with the five marks of mission. Uh, they use very commonly. Um, uh, they are cover lots of different areas. Um, and I think perhaps we tend to assume that the one that relates to animals is the fifth mark of mission, um, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Um, but I'm going to ask whether uh, any of the others have anything to do with uh, animals and unsurprisingly, I'm going to argue that they that they do. I wonder with these five marks of mission, uh, what you think of them, are they comprehensive? Why are they in that order, I wonder? What does it tell us about our priorities? Are they in an order of priority? Or is it an order of kind of cascading out that we start from the good news of the kingdom and that that kind of naturally and inevitably gets out to the whole of creation? I wonder whether you've thought about that before. I'm going to argue uh, that God's care for creation is something which applies to all God's creatures and it's not a bolt on extra, it's not a niche interest which people who can be bothered to reach, read all the way down to the fifth mark get interested in and everyone else shouldn't, um, but that it is essential to Christian discipleship and Christian ministry, uh, mission and ministry. Um, I'm going to look at the five marks of mission, but I'm going to address them in reverse order. Uh, I'm going to start with creation and I'm going to end with the good news of the kingdom and see whether we find God's care for animal as, uh, as we go throughout. So the fifth mark of mission is treasure to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and to sustain and renew the life of the earth. So this is the one that which most obviously might relate to animals, but even here it doesn't say creatures that are named, it says creation and the earth. I think sometimes we find it easier to care for creation in the abstract than we do for individual creatures. Nature is red in tooth and claw, we know that animals die all the time. Is it really possible that God cares individually for each creature? Or is it that creation is really only valuable because it's the home of human beings? Well, the quote that I've got up there, Simon Oliver argues that each creature should be regarded as meaningful because each creature, human and non-human, derives its meaning from God. Every creature is a sign of God's beauty, truth and goodness. And we see that in what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29. Uh, he tells us that the sparrows are of worth to God. Not one will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. 
The fourth mark of mission uh, is uh, to transform, to seek to transform the unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, to pursue peace and reconciliation. So surely you might say this relates squarely to human communities alone and not to animals. But note the addition of the second clause, which was only added in 2012, to challenge violence of every kind and to pursue peace and reconciliation. I wonder if justice is really simply a matter for human beings, or should we as Christians be concerned for the unjust structures which supply our food, which keeps millions of animals in conditions which do not allow for their flourishing? Is it an issue of justice for the animals which human society has bred into existence for its own purposes to live lives which are painful and limited? The Christian of Ethics of Farmed well Animal Welfare Project has examined uh, the main types of animal ag agriculture and it's asked its expert team to what extent it allows the animals kept in them to flourish. And David's going to tell us a lot more about this later. But uh, here's just one little example. Uh, this is the findings for uh, dairy cattle. And um, I'll just give you a few moments to look at that, but you'll see that it, it looks at different aspects of things which were identified, which would uh, enable flourishing and different uh, systems of farming common in the UK and to what extent they um, allow those forms of flourishing or anti-flourishing in some cases. Um, not all animals which are farmed in this country do have uh, the worst of conditions. There are some better systems, um, but the worst conditions do tend to be in the vast majority um, subject to the minimum requirements of the law, which are, are not as bad as in some other countries. But even the best standards still have some features which deny aspects of flourishing to the animals kept in them. And so the question is, is this a uh, concern for um, uh, unjust structures of society. The Christian tradition has always had some who have regarded justice as not just as a matter for humans, but also for animals, as Joel's just explained. And uh, in the quote that I've got up here, Jürgen Moltmann says, violence committed by people against other people and by human beings against weaker creatures is a sin and a crime against life. And I think um, it's really interesting uh, that that has been highlighted and um, how the suffering is um, both for the animals and for those who are inflicting the suffering that it does harm to us, which again goes back to some of the things Joel said about um, the, the concern of the impact on us when we are violent against animals. But the exploitation involved in intensive farming um, often has a really um, negative impact on humans as well as on the animals. Um, and generally speaking, it is on the poorest and most exploited of humans in other ways. We're told about the uh, huge impact of um, animal agriculture in contributing to climate change. And we know that that impacts on the poorest communities globally, um, first and worst before the richer. But there's also the impact of those who are actually working in the animal um, agriculture system themselves. Um, in David Clough's book, there's a reference to that at the bottom. Uh, that's up on Moodle, by the way, so you can read that. Um, he points out that work in slaughterhouses is usually unskilled, low paid, low status and unpleasant, high staff turnover and injury rates. Um, psychological harm and PTSD, unfortunately, are not uncommon. And in both farming and in slaughterhouses, um, there is often a recruitment of the poorest and especially immigrants. The drive towards efficiency in farms um, to drive down prices often makes working conditions intolerable. So to our third mark of mission, tend to respond to human need by loving service. Again, we might respond to this with the same question we had about the fourth mark of mission, why this anthropocentric focus simply on human need rather than the wider need of all God's creatures. 
But as a church, I think we're called to be prophetic, calling ourselves and our culture back to a closer alignment with the will of God for all his creatures to end exploitation and suffering. So how do we as Christians respond to this need by loving service? I think one thing to em em emphasize is that farmers, most farmers are doing their best to do exactly this. In most instances, they're caring for the animals they look after the best way that they can within the risk constraints of the systems that they're working with. And I think as Christians, one of the things we can do is to support our farming communities, to acknowledge that in caring for their animals, they're carrying out their vocation to serve God. But the pressure of the system to produce huge quantities of low cost meat, milk and, and eggs that they're laboring under often make it impossible for them to avoid the um, things which compromise their animals' welfare. As a church, I think we need to um, help by following the recommendations, which I'm sure David will talk about, um, uh, from the uh, Farmed Animal Welfare Project to eat much smaller quantities of much higher welfare animal products. So when we do choose to serve meat, we choose, choose higher cost, higher welfare versions and support those farmers who want to work in those higher welfare ways with their animals. In this way, we can be that servant species, which Lindsay talks about in the quote that I've got up on the page there. So we're on the fourth mark of mission now uh, to teach, uh, baptise and nurture new believers. If we're going to do this, we need to be clear what our faith really means. Is it good news simply for uh, humanity or is it good news for all God's creatures together? And what kind of church should Christians be striving to build and to be um, uh, educating new believers within? How do human relationships with non-human animals shape the nature of the community of the church that we are seeking to build? We're trying to build a human community which is transformed by the Holy Spirit into God's kingdom, where God's values are lived out and new believers are nurtured in a faith which transforms every aspect of their lives. And that includes that most intimate and significant act of eating, which Wurzba has um, unpacked so beautifully here in his book, Food and Faith, that's also on Moodle. How we live our life as a church um, enables us to uh, respond to uh, God's love. So as we embark on different types of ministry to which God's called us, I think we need to ask, is the relationship between human and non-human animals and with the created order more widely, is that a key catechetical need that we should be addressing when we're teaching and nurturing new believers? Finally, we've got to the first mark of mission, uh, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. I guess this is what we classically mean when we talk about evangelism, what we may traditionally mean by mission. We tend, I think, to uh, uh, assume that this is thinking about personal salvation. But what is the good news of the kingdom and what is the kingdom in the first place? John 3.16, that very well-known verse, tells us that God so loved the world. And the word for world here is cosmos. Um, the good news is good news for, um, for all of the world, for all of creation. And I would argue that our job as proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus is to show how it is good news for all of creation, um, for human and for non-human animals. A final quote from um, this uh, passage, which um, is available online um, from Simon Oliver. The kingdom is not a political and cultural structure. It is a creation kingdom in which an original peace devoid of exploitation is re-established. This can be reaffirmed by understanding the intrinsic meaning and value of every creature as a gift to itself, which mediates the divine goodness. The gospel is therefore good news for creation, not simply for humanity. So a final reflection, if care for creation is a core part of the gospel of Christ and the mission of the church, what is your calling in your ministry? And I mean that in its widest senses. Um, 
what is your response? Um, so David, over for you, to you for your section. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to talk you through the project that has um, uh, enabled this uh, working with uh, Sarah and Cheryl and uh, Joel and give you a sense of the wider uh, framework uh, that we've been pursuing in that project. Um, so I'll also uh, do my best to share my screen. Um, so this was a project, a research project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, the first three years went between 2018 and 2021. And one of the key features that I was really glad about for the project was that we had uh, major churches in the UK as partners represented on the project. So uh, we had Church of England, Roman Catholic Church, Methodist Church, URC, uh, churches in the Church of Scotland. Uh, all sending representatives to the project. And that meant that right from the outset, we had the real asset of ha having sort of interests of, of churches and church members uh, and rural communities as farmers, because uh, several of the churches were represented through their national rural offices, um, sort of integrated in the into the project, which um, I think is really important for our ability to produce something that uh, might be received by the churches, which was uh, the, uh, the key uh, goal. Uh, so what I want to do, and then in this extra year, uh, an education uh, year, we're working with uh, school RE teachers, um, with uh, Sarah, Cheryl and Joel as staff in theological education institutions, and with a pilot group of church schools to explore uh, the development of learning resources um, and case studies for wider school practice uh, that relate to the project. What I'd like to do just in the few minutes I've got is just run through um, thinking about why focus on farmed animal welfare specifically, uh, why a Christian approach might be um, interesting and important, uh, why we chose flourishing as a way of framing uh, an ethic Christian ethical approach to farmed animal welfare, uh, and then briefly give you an overview of our analysis of what farmed animals need to flourish um, and how far current farming systems enable that flourishing. Um, and I'll point you to a freely available uh, policy framework document, a 60 page document we've produced uh, with uh, much more detail about um, uh, this uh, analysis that you can uh, download or ask for copies of it in print. Um, and then uh, come on to that question that we've already had raised of what the practical implications of taking this seriously might be. So we've had a number of um, answers to the question of why focus on farmed animal welfare um, already, um, especially in uh, Cheryl's um, account. One of the ways that I frame um, the urgency of this issue is to say um, around 1900, uh, the, the whole biomass of farmed animals outweighed that of wild animals by about three and a half times. And then during the uh, next hundred years, we halved the biomass of wild animals and nearly quadrupled the biomass of farmed animals. So that by the time we got to 2000, the biomass of farmed animals outweighed that of wild mammals by 24 times. And since then, uh, I, haven't had, I haven't got up-to-date statistics, but numbers of farmed animals has been rising and numbers of wild animals has been falling. And so that gives you a sense of the urgency of uh, addressing this issue. And it highlights, if you care about um, what's happening to animals, paying attention to farmed animals is a really significant uh, feature. And every time that, that Simon Oliver um, quote that you mentioned, uh, Sarah, and the connection about sort of being attentive to the well-being of every creature, just like Jesus talked about in relation to sparrows. When I try and put that alongside the sort of billions of chickens that are being raised in broiler systems, um, that sort of drives my sense of a real scandal in relation to what's going on for this sort of vast majority of um, uh, animals on earth and that doesn't even begin to count um, even vaster numbers of fish that are uh, being farmed uh, now about half of uh, fish that we consume comes from, come from farmed environments that are generally fully impoverished. So why take a Christian approach? Well um, hopefully for those joining this call it's um, an, a, an obvious uh, starting point but I also think it's interesting 
that a Christian approach to farmed animal welfare might point in some interesting new directions in terms of how we frame our thinking. Um, one example of that for me is thinking about importance of what it might mean to respect the flourishing of animals in their giving and receiving of maternal care. And so when I first went on a farm visit and looked at an uh, amazing farm in uh, Devon that was doing organic uh, chicken production, one of the things that I was struck was that it was a beautiful environment and the chickens were getting to uh, range freely. One of the things that struck me is that mother hens, even in this astonishingly positive environment, never met their chicks. And it seems to me that if you take an idea of flourishing, which isn't unique to Christianity, but I think we've got very good um, biblical and wider theological reasons for being attentive to what God's creatures need uh, to live uh, a, a full and flourishing life. Those sort of um, aspects of current agricultural systems come to the fore in a way that I think maybe a utilitarian or animal rights approach don't uh, highlight in quite the same way. Um, so flourishing um, seems to me a very good way of framing a Christian ethical uh, approach. It sort of takes uh, animals seriously as creatures of God and takes up some of those themes that Cheryl uh, talked through uh, biblically about um, creatures, God's creatures praising God through their uh, living. Um, and that seems a very powerful way of talking about how Christians might sort of take a God's eye view of these fellow animal creatures that we live alongside and what it means for them to do well um, as uh, fellow creatures. So flourishing uh, seems a good way of framing that. It also seemed a very good way within the project of opening a dialogue for discussion about farmed animals that didn't, that allowed everyone with very different starting points uh, to make a contribution. Um, so we had people, we had vets working in industrial dairy systems, and then we had vegan um, uh, representatives of Christian animals charities, um, and then we had um, national rural officers from churches, and we had farmers all sitting around the table trying to work out what we might be able to say together. And flourishing was a uh, and thinking about what what farm animals need to flourish uh, seemed to be a point of connection and a way of having a conversation that didn't immediately um, close things down. So in our framework. We go species by species of the major animals farmed in the UK and ask what they need to flourish. Um, and we drew on, we were very lucky to work in an interdisciplinary way with a veterinary um, academic farmed animal welfare specialist, uh, Professor Siobhan Mullen, who's now at University of Dublin. Um, and um, so we drew on contemporary animal welfare science uh, in uh, dialogue with Christian ethics uh, to think about this idea about what particular species need uh, to flourish. And so in the framework, and I'll show you the URL in a moment, um, we've produced these uh, charts that Siobhan drafted for us about the kinds of things um, different kinds of animals need. And then, um, as Sarah mentioned, we evaluate the current certification systems in relation to how they um, uh, respond to different aspects of uh, uh, um, particular, the flourishing of particular kinds of uh, creatures. Um, and so we evaluate them in order to uh, say, well, the, this kind of certification seems to only offer poor opportunities for flourishing. Um, the, this one offers better, and this is the sort of best available. So we produce a very simple, uh, scheme of classification uh, that is aimed to guide uh, decisions um, about purchasing um, and uh, production systems. Um, so we do the same in relation to uh, fish um, uh, and uh, sheep uh, and uh, pigs. Uh, that was an image from a, one of our farm visits to an organic uh, pig farm, uh, which was a, a real treat. Uh, and a very pleasant contrast to the intensive pig farm that we visited uh, a month or so earlier, which uh, was was difficult. Um, and so we work through species by species. So what kind of animal do we have here? What do, what do pigs uh, uh, need in order to flourish? And then evaluate these current uh, certification uh, schemes. And then in relation to uh, cows as well. And um, yeah, this image uh, that we've um, found is very like the farm that we uh, took um, 
the C4 education people to a, a modern dairy farm where calves are removed from uh, their mothers uh, immediately after birth with no opportunity for giving or receiving of uh, maternal care and calves kept in um, uh, away from their mothers in uh, that kind of uh, confine. So we've already had questions about um, practical implications and we, uh, the, the key implications that Sarah's uh, mentioned are first of all, we need to reduce overall consumption of animal products. We can't give animals uh, higher welfare at current production levels. That just um, isn't going to be uh, possible in uh, because of all kinds of constraints on the system. It's only uh, the intensification industrialization of animal agriculture that's allowed anything like the current of volume of um, animal agriculture. So reducing consumption is important for animal welfare as well as um, important for environmental sustainability, the climate crisis, um, and also human uh, well-being. Human health isn't uh, well served um, in many countries by the levels of consumption of animal products that we currently have. And second, the animal products that we continue to consume, we need to think about sourcing them from farming systems that promote the flourishing of farmed animals. And so our key recommendation is uh, for churches and other Christian organizations to move away from sourcing animal products from uh, systems that offer poor opportunities for flourishing and substitute uh, them with smaller numbers of animal products that come from better or ideally best available uh, systems. So a very practical, uh, an implementable um, uh, finding that we think uh, churches could take up. Um, so this is the policy uh, framework. It's beautifully uh, laid out and uh, illustrated. We hope it's going to be really engaging. You can find it at abdn.ac.uk forward slash c4. Um, and um, if you're interested in print copies, uh, and, that, and they will be useful in any context, um, uh, there's an opportunity to request them or, or um, you can find an email address for us to, to uh, do that. So this is uh, it's freely available as a, a PDF uh, download. Um, OK, I better stop there on uh, grounds of time, but I hope that's been a useful just initial overview of the project. Wonderful. Thank you, David. That's really, really helpful. Well, it's one minute to one. So I think perhaps we need to uh, uh, draw a line there. Thank you so much, Cheryl, David and Joel uh, for taking part. Uh, I think I'll hand back to Mike. Yeah, I just want to say uh, thank you again. Thank you to all four of you for uh, leading us through this and for responding to questions so well. It's been rich and fascinating and we are in your debt. So thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for turning up and uh, asking questions and listening. And um, I hope you have a good and not too snowy rest of day.